of the greatest joys we have in life are relationships, real breathing relationships with people who are fun. I think it's very important to get come together as a community, um, to pray. You know, God says when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. And um, I just think it's so important to, to lift up our church as a community. No matter who they are, no matter where they're from, it's like, hey, you belong here, you know, because we're the kingdom of God and you belong and we belong and we all belong. Good morning, Covenant. This is Pastor David Kling. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers who are watching. We're so thankful for you. Uh, Miss Allison is going to lead a special prayer for our mothers in just a moment with our children. Uh, but I really am so excited to present this whole worship service for you. Uh, today we're going to focus on the story of when Jesus ascended into heaven. And what happens when a change happens out of the blue? And how do you make adjustments? It's a powerful message from Pastor Hunsicker uh, that you've got to see to believe. It's truly spellbinding, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we've got beautiful photography from all over Madison County and powerful presentations from our musicians. So I'm excited to get to worship with you today. Let's join Miss Allison. Good morning. I hope you guys are doing great. I wanted to say a special um, Happy Mother's Day to all of the special wonderful women in our life, in my life, and I hope that you say thank you, and I love you to the moms and the aunts and the grandmas in your life. Georgie made me this special necklace for Mother's Day, and it's a treasure. He put buttons on it, he tied it with a special string. And he drew me a picture of flowers. It was very special. When I was little, I remember I would call my aunt, I would call my grandmother. Um, and you know, it's a day that we can say thank you to all of the women in our life who love us. And um, no matter where you are today, know that God loves you. And God gave you the gift of the family that you have, no matter what that family looks like. And so take a minute today to call somebody special or to give somebody special a hug in your house and say thank you uh, for loving me and taking care of me. And that's what Jesus does for you and for me. Jesus loves us and takes care of us. So let's say a special prayer. I want to remind you that this week I'll be doing Miss Allison every day at 10 o'clock. And this week the theme is surprises. So we're going to be looking at some different surprises in the Bible. The Bible is full of really interesting and fun and exciting surprises. Like I was surprised when I got my special necklace from Georgie. All right, let's pray together and then I hope you really enjoy today's service. Lord, we thank you for this special day to honor the special women in our life. We thank you um, for the family that we have at Covenant, a church family that loves each other and cares for each other even from afar. I thank you for all of our Covenant kids, no matter where they are, no matter who they're with, God, in their little homes, their little families, we ask that you would be with them. And I thank you for each child that you have given to our church and to our families to love and to take care of. We thank you for moms, for aunts, for grandmothers, for all the women in our life who are special to us, who love us, and who care for us. We thank you that you are close to us today on this special day, and that you have a good plan and a perfect plan for our lives. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Time for Miss Allison, and I hope you guys have a great day. Bye.
Good morning, Covenant family, friends, folks watching us on the internet from all over America and, and perhaps even the world. Uh, I'm so happy to welcome you this morning to our worship service and, and the sermon I'm giving right here in our chapel, which is a beautiful space uh, with stained glass and, and it's just a wonderful space. And I'm choosing to preach from the chapel today because we uh, here at the church, the session, the trustees, the staff members have been working diligently to figure out when and how to open the church building and how to make it as safe as possible for everyone. And I thought it would be very symbolic to be back in the building preaching this sermon this week. Um, you know, last week we talked about this theme of journey and, uh, and the journeys that we're on emotionally, spiritually, physically, uh, and this journey of coronavirus. But you know, one of the things that occurred to me is I never actually told you about any of the journeys I've taken in my life. So I wanted to begin this week by telling you about perhaps the biggest journey I've ever taken, which was a 21 day journey zigzagging across the country from North Carolina to California in 2009 when I moved to California. And uh, I've got a Google map I'm gonna throw up that, I, that I've kept all these years of just all the places I stopped. And you can tell that they're clustered mostly in the Southeast of the country because that's where I knew the most people. And I couch surfed. I didn't, I didn't pay for a hotel room the whole trip. And you can tell at the end uh, that trip got really long because I had to drive from Durango, Colorado all the way to Pasadena, California the last day uh, without stopping because I didn't know anybody on the west side of the country. Um, but anyway, uh, that trip is a, is a trip I look back on with fond memories and, and especially because of the car I took it in. Uh, a 2002 Jeep Liberty, uh, and, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, but this car, uh, I got this car in a, in a pretty interesting story. So when I moved to Scotland in 2005, I sold the first car I'd ever owned, which was, which was a 1993 Jeep Cherokee, uh, in order to help fund my trip to Scotland. And when I came back, I didn't have a car. And you know, I, I had gotten used to not having a car in Scotland where you can walk everywhere and take buses and trains, but in Durham, North Carolina, where I was gonna be living, you had to have a car. And uh, around that time, my aunt, who lived in Burlington, Vermont, uh, contacted my dad and, and, told her, and told him that she had this Jeep Liberty that she was thinking about trading in and, and getting a different car with, and, and maybe that I would be interested in it. And, and so the long story short is I ended up with this Jeep Liberty and I had to go uh, get it from Burlington and bring it down to North Carolina. Um, but that car was amazing and I, and I took so many trips on it over the years. Um, and, and that car made its way from Burlington to North Carolina and then from North Carolina to Missouri when I moved to Missouri and then back to North Carolina and then all the way across the country to California and up and down the West Coast. And then when Barbara and I got married, uh, we only needed one car in LA and I sold it uh, to help uh, fund our new life together. And the guy I sold it to came up from Mexico and bought it and took it down to Mexico. So who knows where that car is now, but, but it, was a, it was a tough car and I'm sure it is still running in some form or fashion. Um, but the thing about uh, that journey that California journey is mostly about that car and all the adventures I had in that car. I had a lot of adventures in that car. Uh, some, some great ones actually. I went hiking in Big Sur. Uh, I took some friends golfing in Palm Springs. Uh, I even got to go fly fishing uh, in Western Colorado. And you know, uh, that car was just so great and spacious and, and versatile, but the biggest trip, or I, I should say uh, the most intense journey that I took in that car was actually not that 21 day road trip and not any of those other hiking trips. It was the very first trip I took in that car after I got it from my aunt. And that was a trip where I was gonna be going from Durham, North Carolina down to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, right after I moved back from Scotland, I was gonna go down and see some friends, catch a Braves game. Uh, and, and so I jumped in the car and, and, I, and I headed down the road. 
But, um, you know, one thing about that car uh, that I didn't know, because it was new to me, was that my aunt, uh, before she gave me the car, had had the tires rotated. And if you've ever had your tires rotated, you might know that uh, they, they kind of tell you sometimes, uh, you know, drive it around for about 15 miles and then come back and we'll tighten up the lug nuts for you. And I guess she never went back to get the lug nuts tightened up. And so uh, I'm on the road uh, on I-85 going, going to Atlanta, just south of Greensboro, North Carolina, which means I haven't even been on the road for a whole hour. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just sort of driving along, driving along, and all of a sudden, I hit a huge pothole, and, and the front left side of my car dips down really hard and pops back up. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that was the biggest pothole ever. And uh, I remember looking immediately up to my rear view mirror, and I didn't see it. And I looked over to my side view mirror, because I wanted to see how big this pothole was. And, and as I was looking at my side view mirror, all of a sudden I noticed alongside of me, parallel uh, to the car on the side of the road, my wheel just rolling by itself. Uh, and all of a sudden I realized I hadn't hit a pothole. My wheel had come off. The, the last few lug nuts that had been holding it in place came off and the wheel just popped right out. And my car I don't know how because the Jeep Liberty was a weird shaped car. It was maintaining perfect balance. And, and in that moment, uh, you know, I had, I had two places I could go. I could either freak out or, or I, could, I could problem solve the situation. And, and I don't know how or why, but I chose the second one. And in the most serene I've ever been in my life, I began to think, okay, what do I do? Well, if I slam on the brakes and force the car into a very quick stop, there's a really good chance that I'll tumble uh, as, as I go lopsided. And I'm in the left lane. Can I make it across two or three lanes of traffic to the right side of the road? It's probably not safe to switch lanes. And, and if I did have an accident in the middle, I would be more likely to, to, to get hit by other cars. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my foot off the gas and I'm going to slowly decelerate. And as I decelerate, I'm going to slowly move the car into the uh, median, which was going to be grass, and I'll come to a skidding stop in the grass. And, and you know, maybe I'll flip or roll or maybe, maybe I won't, but that's got to be the best decision. So I did it and, and I executed it perfectly. And, and as the car decelerated and I moved to the side of the road, the front dropped and skidded and in fact uh, my disc brakes were shredded and, uh, and eventually I skid right into the grass and came to a stop and my wheel rolled right by me and went like another hundred feet down the road before it stopped and uh, I was alive. But that's not even the craziest part of the story. So, so I'm on the side of the road, I go get my wheel and I roll it back, and then I, I don't know what to do, uh, so I call my dad, and my dad's about an hour and a half away, but he's gonna come down and meet me. And I pull out my jack, and, and I try to get the jack up under, under the front of the car to prop it up, because may, maybe I can take some lug nuts off some other uh, tires or wheels and, and, and makeshift uh, the situation. But I'm having trouble getting the jack in the right position because the, the car is off of, of any sort of uh, elevation and, and the median is actually slowed down. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these two guys pop up wearing orange vests who had been uh, cleaning the median. And, and they're like, hey, do you need any help? And I was like, yeah, actually, I could really use some help. I'm, I'm trying to jack up the car and I'm, I'm going to put the wheel back on. Uh, and, and, the, and one guy, before I, before I even know it, uh, they're helping me lift it up and we get the jack in place. Uh, but all of the black insulation, the cloth stuff that's on the underside of your car uh, was shredded up and it was hanging down and we really couldn't see anything. And so, so the one guy jumped under the car real quick and said, hey, hand me a utility knife and I'll cut this out. So I reach into my glove compartment and I get my knife that I always have with me and I hand it to him 
And as I'm looking down and sliding it under the car to him and he grabs it, I notice for the very first time ever that the orange vest has the word in me written across it. I have just given a knife to a prisoner. Now, if you want to know how that story ends, you're going to have to wait until the end of the sermon. That's what we call a cliffhanger. It's a classic literary device uh, that you know Charles Dickens was actually famous for using. Um, and, and what it does is it leaves the audience wanting to come back for more, right? And, and all good stories have a cliffhanger. All good serials or, or sequels uh, work off of the idea of cliffhanger. And in fact, Luke's gospel ends with a huge cliffhanger. Remember last week we were in Emmaus with Jesus and he had just revealed himself to some disciples and, and then he disappeared. And they run back to Jerusalem and then they tell all the other disciples and then he appears to all the disciples together. And then Luke says uh, that sometime after that they all walked out to Bethany together and at Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem, Jesus ascended into heaven. The end. What is going on? Jesus is dead. No, he's alive. He's here. No, he's gone. He has come back. No, he has left us. Nobody knows what's going on. But, but gospel, Luke's gospel ends on that cliffhanger. The good news for us is that Luke is like a Hollywood showrunner. He knows that you've got to end season one on a good cliffhanger so that the audience comes back with more expectations for how great season two is going to be. And, and, and he has left us on a cliffhanger because he knows he is writing season two. Acts, the Acts of the Apostle, is, is Luke's second season in the story of, of the early church and the life of Jesus. And, and so it begins, like all good stories do, and all good season twos, with a recap of what happened in season one. So, so that the folks that are jumping in that maybe don't quite remember or, or didn't get to catch the ending won't be left in the dust. So Acts chapter one uh, is our recap and I'm gonna read that for us now. This is Acts chapter one, verses one through 11. Listen for the word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you to heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So is this how Jesus' earthly ministry ends after all? After triumph, disappearance, and, and instructions for, for the apostles to shelter in place? 
There's just so many questions left unanswered, right? Well, how long? And when is it going to be safe to go out again? And by the way, what does the Holy Spirit look like? But before Jesus answers any of them, he's gone. And the disciples are just caught with their jaws open, looking up, waiting as if he's going to come right back. And they must have looked really stupid because God had to send some angels to, to, to send them on their way, right? Except for they don't actually look that stupid to me. I think that's probably what we would have been doing too. Can you blame them? I mean, everything in the story up until this point has given them the expectation that this is the moment that the kingdom's coming. Jesus has conquered death. He has conquered the Romans. He has conquered the Sanhedrin. What is left? It is the revolution. The revolution is here. The army is ready. The world is ready to be taken by the Christians. And we, we the audience, are here for it. That's why we're ready to watch season two. Because that's where season one brought us to and we know it's about to happen. And all of a sudden, Luke says, push pause on that idea. There's some other things I have to tell you. And we're confused, just like the disciples. I mean, that's not what this show was supposed to be about. Now, you can probably tell, I've been binge watching a lot of TV during this quarantine. And, and I've learned how the, how the transitions happen between episodes and between seasons. And, and, and normally they're pretty straightforward. But one show Barbara and I just got finished watching the, the latest season of is, is HBO's Westworld, which uh, just finished broadcasting their third season. And the leap that happens between season two and season three is insane. We go from 18th century and 19th century American West all of a sudden to 22nd century, future, dystopian, technocratic America, a world that none of the audience understands overnight. And, and, and the time shift to the future is weird, and, and the scene shift from, from the Western rural world to the modern uh, or, or ultra-modern urban futuristic aesthetic is weird. And the characters are weird. They're all new characters. You have to learn all these new people. And all the people you fell in love with over the first two seasons are gone. In fact, one of the big reasons Barbara and I even watched the show is because we went to church with an actor that had been in the first two seasons. He had one cameo in the third season. It was really disappointing for us. And, and, and all season long, we had no idea what was going on. We had to watch the whole season just to understand what was happening even at the beginning of season three. And that's actually kind of what's happening here in Luke's second season. Everything has changed. It's a new world. There are new characters. There are new plot lines. We have to all of a sudden figure out who the Holy Spirit is and who Paul and Barnabas and Timothy are. And the only way the story is, makes sense is if the audience gives the storyteller patience and, and waits for the story to unfold and, and, and waits for Luke to point out the things that he thinks we need to know to understand the next part of the story. And so that's what's happening all of a sudden at the other side of this cliffhanger is our answers are still not going to get answered immediately. We have to follow the whole season in a way to understand when is Jesus coming back? What are we supposed to do in the meantime? And, and, and how are we supposed to do it? The disciples are forced into a place that they did not expect to be. They are forced to wait, to wait for the Holy Spirit, to wait for the type of transformation that God wants to make in their lives, to take them from being disciples to being missionaries, to wait for their expectations to change and to adjust and to align with what God is doing instead of what they thought he was doing. 
And, and, and if you think about what they had been expecting, that is a hard adjustment to make. They were expecting the kingdom of God to come here and now. And they were expecting that Jesus was going to be with them and at the forefront, the vanguard of that movement. And all of their questions, in fact, to Jesus in this passage are about that kingdom. And so when Jesus leaves with those questions unanswered, those expectations are shattered. And when expectations are shattered or unfulfilled, you know just as well as I do that there's loss, there's mourning. There, there's depression. There is time that has to pass to bring healing and adjustment to new expectations. And, and, and the disciples don't even realize that that's where they're at. The angels have to show up and, and kick them out of Bethany and send them on their way home. And, and, and they have to push the disciples into the future. The disciples are operating out of their old tendencies. They want to stay there and wait for Jesus to come back. Maybe even they're thinking in the same way that they were thinking at the transfiguration in Luke chapter 9 on that mountaintop with Jesus. Maybe they want to build a shrine here. Maybe they even want to have a whole temple complex here and a monastery and live there and, and, and create new rituals and, and religious uh, ceremonies to, to acknowledge this moment and this place where Jesus ascended into heaven and, and, and wait for him to come back. And then maybe people will want to come to them to see the holy mountain of, of the ascension and to hear the story about Jesus. But Jesus doesn't want them to establish another temple. Or, or another set of religious traditions. Jesus is the temple. And, and, and Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit, and, and the movement is going to go outward, not consolidate inward. And, and, and the new way, the way that the angels who are pushing them on, is to go home, to adjust your expectations about what God wants to do, and what the kingdom is going to look like, and to wait for the Holy Spirit to show you what to do next. You, you know, the truth is, we've all had to adjust our expectations during this time of quarantine. A adjusting our expectations about what it's like to do work, when and, and where and how you get it done, working from home or, or working from remote locations. And if you're working from home like me, you've also had to adjust your home expectations. What does it look like to be a good father and a good spouse and a good worker? How can I be physically present as a father when mentally I'm at work? Or how can I be a good worker mentally when, when physically I've got my daughter in my lap and, and she wants me to see her and touch her and play with her and she's annoyed that I'm looking at screens instead? And navigating those issues are just part of life in this time of, of adjusted expectations. And me, personally, I thrive on routine and repetition. So I am all out of whack. And you can ask my wife, Barbara, I hate change. It takes me forever to adjust to change. And the whole process is hard. I get frustrated and I take out my frustrations on myself and, and on people around me, and it's just not good. Uh, but, but it brings me finally to the place of having those adjusted expectations. Usually about two days after Barbara's already made her adjustment, and, and finally we get back on the same page again. And you know, actually the church has had to adjust its expectations. How do we do ministry and provide service? And, and to who? And, and what do we prioritize? And what do we let go by the wayside? Where do we pour our energy and our resources? And how many resources are we going to have on the other end of this? Do we, do we need to be modest in our future projections? All of these questions are swirling and, and we're all adjusting. And, you know, that's actually more normal than we realize, especially for churches. Churches are always having to readjust their expectations to what God wants from them. 
we build these beautiful big buildings and like the disciples we look up into the sky and we wait for God to do something about it to fill them with people and we plan out all these great programs and we look up to God and we say okay God now give us people to program and when it doesn't happen the way we thought it would we have to adjust our expectations now I know you're uh, wanting to know how that trip to Atlanta ended. So, so let me tell you, I have, I'm looking down and I've just read the words in me after giving a knife to a prison inmate. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, my life is in danger. And, and so as nonchalantly as possible, so as not to alert the other prison inmate I'm standing next to, I kind of glanced to my left and to my right, and there to my right, about 20 feet away, is a prison guard with a shotgun. Whew, I think. Crisis averted. The prisoners are nice, and they help me get my car back uh, up and, and the wheel on with lug nuts, and they hand me my knife back, and we shake hands, and uh, I slowly drive my car down the interstate to the next uh, exit and wait in a Walmart parking lot for my dad to arrive and, and, and we, we get the car towed by AAA and he has brought me a new car and I continue my journey to Atlanta delayed. I miss some of the things I wanted to be at. I don't get to see some of the people I wanted to see. I'm not having the first amazing adventure in my new car that I thought I would but my expectations have been adjusted and my trip has continued. You know, at Covenant, the truth is we were actually already trying to make some adjustments uh, to our expectations together before the quarantine came. We were trying to figure out how to be more missional, how to be more off the campus with our ministry. Uh, whether that was new small groups or, or new uh, service projects in the community. We were beginning a new leadership cohort where we were going to be training people to be leaders wherever they are. Not just on Sundays here at the church, but at their jobs, in their homes. Uh, we, we think that good Christ-like leadership happens everywhere as a form of mission. And, and we want people to be in mission and in ministry everywhere. That's why at the end of our worship service, we have our charge where we recite together wherever we go, God has sent us. And, and we are trying to adjust those expectations. And, and we are already in the process of doing that with, with discipleship and ministry and even what it meant very, to be a Christian, really. And, and the deepest irony of this whole experience is that God has really forced our hand. He said, okay, you believe that ministry happens off the campus? I'm shutting down the campus. Go out there and prove it. And, and you know, in some ways we have done that. We've been, we've been successful in making the off the campus transition. And we've been successful at providing some form of discipleship training and some form of small group study and, and some form of worship. But in some ways we haven't. In some ways, we haven't been able to make the adjustment to being in mission. And, 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 you know, maybe that is because of the quarantine or maybe not. But we want to continue to push ourselves to be in mission and ministry away from 301 Drake, away from the campus. And, and, and we want to take the successes we've had from the quarantine and build on them. And we want to take our failures, the places we fell short, and learn from them and make that a part of our ministry going forward. We want to adjust our expectations to the way God wants us to be in ministry in Huntsville in the 21st century. And those expectations might require us as a congregation to change, to change what we think worship looks like, to change our familiarity and comfort with rituals and, and traditions and ceremonies that have always been a part of our past, but may not fit the future that God is leading us to. We all are in a period of adjustment. We've all had our expectations unfulfilled in some ways, and now we are all waiting for the Holy Spirit to come 
and to lead us in that adjustment to new expectations and a new future together. And, and the thing is that this week, you can be intentional about that. Like the disciples, you can go home and you can wait together and you can ask the Lord, what expectations do you have that need to be adjusted in your, in your home lives, in your business life, in your, in your church life, your ministry, your worship, your service, uh, all of these things. And together, as we wait for the Holy Spirit, we can, we can follow the path of the disciples. Next week, we're going to see that the disciples, uh, when they went home to Jerusalem and they waited, waiting didn't mean doing nothing. They were actively preparing for the Holy Spirit to come. They were making business decisions and structure decisions, and they were worshiping, and they, and they were asking God what they should be doing, and they were reading scripture. And, and so when the Holy Spirit does come, they're able to hit the ground running, and the mission is off. They were not needing to mobilize after the Holy Spirit arrived because they were prepared to mobilize for when the Holy Spirit arrived. And we can be asking ourselves this week, what type of preparation do we need to be doing as a community so that when the campus opens up, we hit the ground running? And, and, and what are the things that we can already be doing away from the campus that is building those networks of mission and discipleship throughout the city that's going to enable us to be successful in making these adjustments together. Now, I want you to join me now in praying for the Holy Spirit to come and in praying for God to adjust our expectations, to change our hearts, to lead us into the post-quarantine ministry that he has for Covenant Presbyterian Church here in Huntsville. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit, come into our hearts and change our hearts. Those traditions, those rituals, those old expectations that we are clinging to, that we need to let go of, Lord, soften our hearts. Allow us to mourn and, and to, to love them and cherish them for what they are and to let them go when the time comes for those traditions and rituals that we need to hold on to because they are in fact preparing us for ministry in the world. Uh, show us how to adjust our ways of using them and, 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 and being in ministry together in a way that truly brings us into a world where we are in ministry off the campus and around the city and in our daily lives. Use this time, Lord, to help us to become the disciples that you would have us be. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for that powerful message, Dave. Uh, all of us are having to learn to make adjustments in this season. Our church has an incredible history. We have served God in so many ways in our past. And once again, God is calling us to listen to Him with fresh ears, to look at Him with new eyes, and to hear His voice calling us about what our next step looks like. That's really what our time of offering is about. This is a time where we rededicate ourselves, everything that we have, to God. And that's more important than ever now in this challenging season. Ask yourself uh, during this song, how is God calling you to follow him in a fresh way this season? I'm so thankful for all of your financial gifts in this difficult time. You are truly helping us to carry out our mission here in Madison County and around the world. So let's dedicate our lives and our finances to God. Heavenly Father, Everything we have belongs to you. In these new and ever-changing times, give us fresh eyes and fresh ears to see you and hear you and to follow you wherever you lead us. We dedicate all of our tithes and our finances to you, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would bless them and use them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, who dwell in dark and sin, thy hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their dark. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love. That wonderful song makes me want to give everything I have to God. And that's the spirit that we're going to have to embrace in this season, as Pastor Hunsaker was saying. Let's come to the Lord again in prayer, uh, lifting up our community into His presence. Heavenly Father, we lift up our community. We pray that you would be with our essential workers here in Madison County, 
and Alabama and throughout the world, that you would lift their spirits and strengthen them, God. Provide them with all the resources that they need to take care of people. We pray for those who are sick, that you would be healing them supernaturally by your Spirit's power. We ask that you would be with each of us, God. We confess the ways that we have fallen short. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would send your Holy Spirit in a fresh new way so that we could continue to make adjustments to follow you. We pray, Lord, that you would hear us as we pray your Son's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. I'm so glad we got to share worship together today. If you found these worship services to be meaningful, I'd encourage you to comment, like, or share the service online, either on YouTube or on Facebook, wherever you're watching. 
This really helps us get the message even further out into the community so that we can continue to carry out our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ who love one another, love God, and serve in the world. Let's join together now in our charge. Wherever we go, God has sent us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. He has a purpose in our being there. He has something he wants to do through us wherever we are. Now go forth with God's benediction. May the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the joy of your Savior Jesus Christ be with you today and all your days. Amen. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have